Now you've been hearing about him all morning, and everybody is probably wondering who this guy Gil Damiani is. Well, Gil is a, a fellow Chicagoan, a, a fellow firefighter, fire chief. He was the assistant chief in uh, Mesa Fire and Medical, although I don't think they called it Mesa and Fire Medical when you were there. It was just Mesa Fire. But anyhow, Gil, you're going to take away this paneled, uh, th th this next section, session with some esteemed panelists, and you got a mixed bag. You're going to talk about vulnerable populations, and you're going to talk about transit dependent people. One programming note. Gil was identified in the program as working for as chair. Um, Gil kind of works for everybody. He works for the state. He works for the Arizona Healthcare Association. He's an emergency management gun for hire, but um, you're not with as chair yet. So I'm wondering if you were doing uh, a little promotion there. All right, take it away, Gil. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thank you all for staying for lunch or after lunch. Uh, Stan brought up earlier today that we're gonna, this is gonna be organic. And we want it to be, uh, you know, from the ground up so that you have real life uh, people that work with, with uh, people with access and functional needs uh, straight on, right on, on the base. And one, one thing I, I kept hearing today is practicing. And I want to share a quick story with you uh, from personal experience. Uh, as Stan mentioned, I grew up in the fire department and back in the day, we used to have uh, sessions where we'd go teach kids in class, in kindergarten. What, you guys still do that? The first line people do that? All right. So I, I was gonna do my daughter's second grade class. And uh, <clears throat> I thought, you know, if I'm gonna teach other second graders, I better practice it at home first. So my, my in-laws were visiting from Michigan and we did a, a fire drill. I had the, the sample smoke detector so they could hear the buzz and how it sounded. And uh, we did it during the day. So my in-laws crawled out of the house, my kids crawled out of the house laughing, joking. And I did it again when the sun went down. And I had a whole completely different reaction from my son. Everybody else did fine. My son was four years old. Where do you think I found him? They were hiding, he was hiding in the closet, crying. So when you talk about practical experience, and doing things, and we talk about exercises. I know Jerry talked about tabletop exercises. Actually getting out and doing whatever you're preaching is important. And uh, we've got some people here, uh, John Scott Williams and uh, Bruce Harvey with Gila River Community that are going to give you some practical experiences as, as it relates to uh, their access and functional aid communities. John Scott. I, I am John Scott Williams. I'm the executive director of Fellowship Square Mesa at Main Street and Power Road. I've been there for 27 years. We are a very high technology uh, community. Our residents uh, use the Alexas to communicate with each other. We have Helpany uh, uses radar and that radar allows our caregivers to know in advance of someone who is a fall risk when they get out of bed. In the two months that we put that into Effect. First month we lowered falls by 40%. The second month we lowered it by 100% on the shift we were using it on. We normally have 20 falls a month. That's 20 calls the fire department didn't have to come out for because normally those type of falls, 15 out of 20, we have to send them out because if we didn't see the fall, a lot of times we have to assume they hit their head and that uh, a brain bleed is dangerous. We're full of technology. We're also on a part of Mesa that the power goes off on a regular basis. So because we have technology and the power goes off, what do we do in between? In the event of a cyber attack, particularly one that impacts critical infrastructure like the power grid, healthcare systems, or communication networks, the effects can be especially severe for vulnerable populations such as the residents and senior living communities. And I have 333 units, 385 residents. I'm a small town with 100 employees on the payroll. Whenever the power goes out, we have a loss of critical services, communication failure, data compromise, and supply chain disruption. If it's just for a few hours, it's all right. 
but the fire department may remember a few years ago a uh, electrical uh, transformer at university and power went out and our power was out for three or four days. We, we do have a backup system is uh, we put in two transformers 27 years ago on the property that we can switch from our main street feed to a, a southern feed and that allows all of my buildings to be powered up. But without that, what are you gonna do with 385 residents and the temperature that we're in? What are you gonna do for the electronics that we have? We've gotta go back to paper in a big way and uh, uh, your printers, uh, we, we are in a situation that we have all of our assisted living buildings have backup generators, but that backup generator is 100%. Solar during the day on one of our buildings works well, but when the sun goes down, then we're on the backup generator and everything is limited. Medical device management, medication management, food and water supply, power backup systems, staff, and training preparedness. If we have something that occurs and it's more than one day, you know, whenever we went into the pandemic, we lost 30% of our staff. And it wasn't that our staff were afraid of the virus, they had to take care of their family. And at that time, nobody knew anything. Whenever you have a power disruption and we don't know how long that's gonna occur, they have to take care of their own families. So in that situation, we are all of our buildings are secure buildings. So nobody can get into the building without having an electronic pass key. That electronic pass key doesn't work when the power goes out. So all of our doors have to be propped open. Well, you need to have more than one person that knows how to open those doors. Uh, it's easy to do if you ever look at sliding doors to say push to open. Most people never even know that. So you have to train for that. Uh, phys uh, con physically moving residents in case of power grid failure, an evacuation plan. You have to concentrate on mobile residents first. Whenever I discuss this to the residents, I say in here, if we had a problem, who would go out first? And most of the time they say, well, the people in wheelchairs. Everyone, and I then have to say, no, the first people that go out are the most mobile. The least mobile go out last, because I'm not interested in saving onesie, twosie. I'm interested at that point in saving the herd, which means as many people as I can will get out the building first, then we'll have people come in, and I only have to get you from A to B. Our buildings have little, uh, elevator stairwells that people can wait there until the fire department shows up if we have to get them down. We also have equipment that lets people go down the stairs and you don't have to be a genius to use it. They go down the stairs slowly and we can get them downstairs if we, don't, we have a big emergency need. Sheltering in place is our first default. Most likely if something occurred like this, we're not gonna to go to California. We're gonna be stuck here in Mesa, Arizona. So the first default is to stay in place. And we have emergency shelter zones. Because we have backup generators, we will move people to where the air conditioning is. And we can do that. Uh, we have temperature controls. All of my, uh, I have 411 thermostats on the property. They all work from Wi-Fi and they're voice activated. But when the power goes out, they're not going to work. There's no air conditioning. So we have to go to where I have air conditioning working from the backup generators that are on my assisted living. I have a 236 independent living apartments, and if the heat gets too much, I have to move those people into an area. Uh, pets and service animals. This happens on a regular basis. People live on the second and third floor with pets. There's a rule, uh, there's a rule you have to take, you can't say first floor for pets. Since the pandemic, virtually, uh, I'm gonna say 80% of the residents are moving in with pets. And since the pandemic, I've gotten rid of 90% of the carpet in the hallways. So, <laughs> consequent, okay? Well, the other thing that happens is that pet has to be walked three times a day and they get used to walking. 
Now, if the resident is used to using an elevator and they can't get down the steps, how are you gonna take care of all those pets? It's, it's, it's something you have to think about. Individuals with access and functional needs. That, that's all my, all my uh, wheelchair, all my uh, people who are immobile, have to, we have to figure out what to do. If it's gonna be overnight and more than, uh, more than a few days, I have to have bedding for staff because the staff, my key staff are the only people who are gonna show up. During COVID, my key staff were sleeping eight hours, working eight hours, sleeping eight hours, and we did that for months until we were able to get our crew back in. Uh, and then you have to think we have to have a morgue. People die on my property. And uh, uh, you, if there's no transportation and we can't get from A to B, where am I gonna keep those bodies? All of this you have to think about. Uh, coordinating emergency systems. I like uh, Forrest Smith whenever he was talking today. I'm gonna give him a call because I want them to come out to our property on a regular basis. We do, we are in Mesa. You need to have partnerships with the local authorities and you have to work with local authorities to develop a plan. And then attend conferences like this. Without, when I come to this and I've been coming to these for years, every single year I learn something and I meet another person who can help my residents out in time of emergency. It's unbelievable what you do. Uh, management of IT systems, data security and compliance with the, uh, uh, the systems, reliable network infrastructure. It has to be enterprise grade, 24 hour network monitoring and incident response. Our EHR and our EMIR systems, when the power goes out or the Wi-Fi goes out, all those systems, we have to figure out how do we do it. So we have to go back to paper or we have to, if the Wi-Fi goes back, we have to go back to a hardwire connection and we have to train for that. Every time you go to paper, you increase your errors. Every time you go from Wi-Fi to the network, you can increase errors because during that time, the computer can't tell you if that person's already had their medication. You can't rely on whether or not the resident knows they received their medication because many of our residents are confused. Uh, backup and disaster recovery, physical security and access control systems, end user training and support. End users are residents. We, are, we have classes every two weeks so our residents can learn how to protect themselves from phishing, how to protect themselves from uh, ransomware. And uh, the smartest people in my community have come up to me and said they've been hacked. They've been, they've, one person did 10,000, another person did 30,000. And those are the people that have told me, and they're very smart. It, you, not have to, you don't have to be low, low uh, IQ to be suckered in by these scammers. They know Americans are generous at heart and they take advantage of it. And each one of them said, I'm a retired banker and I fell for it. I said, uh, well, uh, the best thing to do is tell everyone what occurred so we know what to look for. Uh, assistive technologies for residents, stability and future proofing. Future proofing is figuring out what can go wrong and do it ahead of time. I was telling you about that radar gadget that helps us with uh, protecting from falls uh, and then that's my sources there. Uh, and living in a community on a regular basis, I have to worry first. And I heard today that we know who the first responders are publicly, but it was also said, I'm a first responder. Whenever my crew responds, I have at least 20,000 alerts a month for my residents. Of that, I call the fire department maybe 20 times a month where they roll on my property. That means 99% of the emergencies we're taking care of. That's often overlooked, but we have a partnership to take care of our residents. I'm so appreciative of all, all the first responders in this room. Thank you. Thanks, John Scott. Uh, we'll, we'll have questions at the end after Bruce and John Scott's presentation. Um, one of the things I'd let, I'd let you know, I've, I've known Bruce for 20 some years. Uh, he is the uh, Director of Emergency Management Office of, 
OEM for Gila River Indian Community, and uh, he was gracious enough to accept our invitation to do this. So, Bruce. Thank you, Gil. Uh, those of you that know Gil, you don't ever say no to Gil. So um, he said, hey, would you help me out? I said, sure. My, my mistake was I didn't ask him what he wanted. <clears throat> so um, first of all, just thank you all. Thank you all. Give yourselves a big round of applause, please. Mm, that was a little weak. Just a little weak there. Can we try it again? One more big round of applause. There we go. Um, I will admit to you, I, I am attention deficit, so you'll have to just follow along real quick. Uh, Stan's back there. Uh, we, I've uh, two and a half minutes to do my presentation. So, um, so if you fa fail to plan, okay, what do you do? You plan to fail. So we, we've we've know that, see that. A lot of good stuff today. Um, uh, my colleagues that are here, I, I do appreciate. They, this is very uh, redundant for them. Um, looking at 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 you know technology and all of the the the, the benefits to it. Uh, where's your redundant plan? Where's your you know your your coop plan? Uh, where's your communication plan? Where do you guys put that at? Scottsdale Fire, great job with stop the bleed. Where's that found in your plan? Uh, where's your training in your plan? Well, well, Bruce, what plan is? It's your emergency operation plan, your EOP. Um, so we talk about a, a population that is is dependent upon transportation. How are you going to how are you going to get people from point A to point B? Uh, in in my community, it, it's it's quite expansive, and and uh, that that does present a challenge. So so you start to look at your plan. You start to see what your plan is. Uh, there's the five steps of the plan. Um, sometimes you're in one at a time. Sometimes you're in all of it. Uh, you know, let's go back to um, I, this will probably send everybody back into trauma COVID and you start thinking about, you know, COVID and your COVID plans and how you work that. There's the, the components of the emergency plan. And uh, I, I, you know, when you take a look at it, obviously, what's the most important for your, your organization? What's the most important? Uh, for you, for you as a manager, um, you know, let's say it's technology, is it communication? Um, you know, those are the kinds of things. Those are the services that you all, there's the terms that you start to look at. I told you I was going to kind of roll through this. Here's your roadblocks, okay? W what are your roadblocks? So the lack of planning, leadership. Uh, if you've got leadership that's on page E and you're on page A, um, we're, we've got some problems with that. Chain of command uh, in leadership. You show up and and you hear the well. I'm 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 the fire chief. I'm the fire chief. I'm in charge. Uh, who's the who's in charge? The fire chief? No. <laughs> it's probably going to be a captain. Your BC, your battalion chief is going to be in charge. When it's uh, law enforcement, who's who's in charge? We all saw yesterday the tragedy that happened in Georgia. You see all of the optics, all of the police, all of the first responders. Who's in charge there? Was it the governor? The governor of the state of uh, uh, Georgia, the governor was there. He committed all the resources. Who was in charge there? So you start to look at when you're starting to build your plan, when you're starting to communicate, who's in charge? And, and how do you communicate that out? And, and we roll through that. Awareness, community support, linking together. Uh, you may know somebody five minutes. You may know somebody um, you know, five years or, or 50 years. Um, you may know Gil. If you know Gil, then you know everybody. So looking at the barriers, when you start to look at a barrier, um, you know, uh, I will admit I, I did put this PowerPoint together myself, so it is very uh, juvenile and it's not really big on, on optics, but it's the best I could do. Um, it's really hard when you color something with your crayon. It, it just it doesn't go on, on the computer screen. So. This is, so that was one of my barriers. Um, we talk about tested. How many of you in here, uh, we talk about having a, an, an on-site morgue. Have we tested that? Have we gone through that? Have we actually taken a deceased body from room 1301 out down to the morgue? And how do we do that? And what time of the day to do? Do we secure the room? Do we secure the hallway? How do we let people know? How do we communicate that? Um, so everybody in this room, my guess is, uh, where, where'd Stan go? 
our KR fireman, probably the first thing he said to you today after he welcomed you is he said, please take a look at all of the exit signs. This is how we get out of here, right? And where are we going to meet? If you came, if you carpooled with your buddy, you know, uh, Chris carpooled with his wife, where are they going to meet if they get separated? How, we, gotta, we have to start talking about that. What, I, I don't, you know, I'm old, 64, and my hearing is gone. So there's sometimes I don't, and it's not, I don't fake it. I don't look at my wife and go, what? <laughs> she, she teaches kindergarten 34 years. She just retired, bless her heart. Okay. Uh, I'm also colorblind. So you start to look at that. Is that a barrier? Well, Stan probably said, hey, if you guys, if we have to evacuate, here's where you go. I'm sure he did that for you all. So why, why would you do that? Because we're communicating. We want you to know where to go, what you're going to do. Okay? Do you, do you gather everything up with you and run out? Okay? If you're a fireman, you just you grab, you know, the 32-ounce. No, you, you grab. The, so you think about what, what do I need? How do I prepare? One thing I look at it, 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 when we talk about plans is how do we test? How do we test it? Okay, well, well, let's talk about it. Okay, we're, we're going we're gonna to fellowship school. We're going to evacuate the entire campus. That's not going to happen. But let's bring some staff in. Let's do a tabletop. Let's talk about it. Let's do an after action. Let's share that. Let's build on that. Is there something we need to know? Everybody has a boss, so let's communicate up the chain. Let's let our, our, our CEOs, let's let our board know. Let's let our community know. How do we, in our community, we use Facebook, we've got a, a text message, um, what else do we do? Billboards, send you to the casino, and there's a lot of ways to communicate, there's a lot of ways to share that information out, okay? Making sure that, that you, if you have a functional need or if there's somebody you know, and we do have a plan, uh, if uh, we have my, our partners here, our entity, Gricua, it's our power company. It's, it's a smaller version of APS, um, way smaller. But Chris is here, and, and, and we have a plan. So if the power goes out, we have a system. We have a way to communicate. We have a way to push information out. How do we share that information? And, and do we test it? Yeah, every once in a while the power goes out, we test it. But we meet twice a year. We talk about it. How do we make improvements? What, what needs to go? We bring in different players, and we share that. Okay, those are the kinds of things that help. So when you're talking about a population that is dependent upon your, you to transport them, okay, do you communicate? Do you let them know? How do you communicate? How often do you communicate? Okay, do you let them see that and do you let them know that? Just real quick in my end, who remembers uh, Katrina? Okay, I'm not talking about your f high school girlfriend, John. The other Katrina. Why it's true. Woo! Okay, so who remembers this picture from Katrina? Okay, we all do. Okay, well, what are some of your thoughts when you see that picture? Like, oh, geez, somebody felt, somebody messed up. That's not true. Okay, they had a plan. They had in their in their emergency operation plan, their evacuation. They had a, an MOU with the school districts to utilize their buses, to utilize their fuel, to utilize their drivers. They had it. They sat and talked about it. They communicated it. Everybody knew about it because they had some issues with transportation. Why did the buses stay where they were at? Because everybody was ordered to evacuate. So their plan didn't include retaining drivers to drive the buses. The drivers were evacuated out as well. So the buses stayed. The water came up. The rain came down and the water came up. So we have that. So was it a failure? Did they, did they plan to fail or did they fail to plan? They didn't include that piece in there. So my hope is that you'll go back and you'll take a look at your plan. Don't, it, don't take the whole plan. You, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Just take it and look. Take it and look. Eat a little. Look at it. Share. Cooperate. Get with somebody in this room. Say, hey, can you help me? Um, and it, Gil, that's all I have. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, John Scott, how large is your community as far as 
It's on 16 acres. Okay, 16 acres and how many people? 330? Uh, 385 residents, 385. 333 units. Bruce, your community is how long? It's uh, 17 acres. Come on, wow, how large is their community? Uh, it goes from uh, Florence to, uh, to Levine. So you've got a few people that are, that are under your responsibility uh, and communicating with them is a, is a concern and, and a, can be a problem at times. Anybody have any questions for either one of these gentlemen? I have one. When, uh, when we talk about communication and communication being effective, how do you know that your message is being reached? I talked to John Scott this morning before, uh, uh, before the, the conference began, and he mentioned to me the process that you used to use with window in, shades. In, in the old days, everybody would open their living room windows by uh, 10 o'clock. That way we knew they got through the evening. Uh, today, we don't have living room windows. Uh, we have patios, and uh, on the patios, if you're in there, uh, there's screens on the patios, but during an emergency, they would put a blanket or something to indicate that they're there. Yeah. So that's a great, great uh, option as communication goes. So thank you, gentlemen, very much. Appreciate your input and your knowledge. Thank you. All right, hold on, you guys. Hold on. Give them a big hand.